So let's look at some problems. We'll spend the rest of the lecture looking at these problems and finding out what the solutions are, or at least the best solutions that have been worked out so far. The first one, and one that I hope that's occurred to you, is how do we know what's primitive? How do we know what's advanced? This has been a major problem for phylogenetic systematics, but there are pretty good solutions to it, and we'll take a look at those in just a minute. Our second problem is what do we do with conflicting data? So sometimes we don't get, not only sometimes, oftentimes, most of the time, we don't get all the characters arguing the certain way. Some shared drive characters argue for E and F going together, and sometimes the shared drive characters argue for F and G going together in monophyletic groups. So how do we make a decision which one is right? And then what about fossils? We've talked about how evolutionary systematists deal with fossils, and we've talked about how phoneticists do deal with fossils. What do cladists do with fossils? How do they treat fossils? And finally, how do we create a classification once we've got a phylogeny? You've got the most experience with this already, but we'll talk a little bit more about it just briefly here to kind of round out our understanding of how that classification process comes about once a phylogeny exists. So in order to find out what characteristics are primitive and advanced, we're going to do something that is called outgroup comparison. So to do outgroup comparison, we need to understand a little bit about what our diagrams are going to show. So the first thing about that we're going to see in these diagrams is we're going to see something I've called an in-group, and this is the group we're studying. It's just been called in-group in the literature, so let's just call it that, but it is our study group. It's the group of taxa we're interested in. It's the ones where we don't know what the phylogeny is, and we want to know the phylogeny so we can create a good classification. The second term we need is our term for the outgroup. The outgroup is going to consist of our sister group to the in-group, so that's really the taxa which is a mo forms a monophyletic group with our in-group, and then there's some other distant outgroup, and that could be the next group, the next sister group down the line, or it could be something that's more distant. Initially, what was done was it was chosen as a more distant outgroup, not necessarily the sister group of our two taxa in-group sister group, not necessarily the sister group of those two taxa, but some more distantly phylogenetic relationship, phylogenetic group. More recently, it's been chosen as the sister group of our two groups, in-group and sister group. In other words, we would take this kind of relationship between those three of them where we have three nested groups. And that's more closely corresponds to what's been doing now. And that's because we have better phylogenies now where we can actually get that information. The other thing we want to look at here is that we're going to call this place here the ancestor of our in-group. And we want to know which states occur there. What primitive state occurs in the ancestor of that group? We want to know what the primitive state is there because if we know what the primitive state is, we can look up here in the in-group and we can find the taxa which have the derived state. And we know those taxa then are in a monophyletic group. So by knowing what's primitive, we know what's advanced. And that lets us create our monophyletic groups, which are our taxonomic groups. So if we know the primitive character state, we know the derived character state, and we can create monophyletic groups based on those derived states. So we're going to look at phylogenetic trees that look something like this. They're based on that tree we just looked at. We're going to see our in-group. And our out-groups. And we are going to look at them either in the case where we have the characters written out or 
sometimes, but very infrequently, look at them with the character codings. And you know that those are basically the same thing. We've just got different ways of working with them. We code them so that we can do numerical operations on them, like the fanaticist did. So here's our first tree. It's the simplest one. Our in-group has a uniform one character state, uniformly there. All of the fruits are fleshy in the in-group. So there's no variation at all. And the out-group we're going to consider has a different character state. They're both dry fruits in the out-group. Well, figuring out the evolution of this character state, fleshy, is very simple in this case. We know that for this character, fruit texture, character state dry changes to character state fleshy in this lineage that leads to our in-group. And so we know that this ancestor of the in-group was fleshy. Now, this doesn't tell us anything about the monophyletic groups within our in-group, but we're doing this now to show you a basic principle of phylogenetic systematics. So let's look at another possible way in which this character, Fleshy, could have evolved in that in-group. So it could have been that dry fruits occurred down here as the primitive state and were retained up into this ancestor here, that dry fruits turned to fleshy fruits here in this lineage, and then they turned back here from fleshy fruits to dry fruits here in the ancestor to this outgroup. Well, you can see already, I think, that we don't really have any direct evidence for that. So our purple plotting of the character requires more evolutionary changes than we have evidence for. We have evidence for at least one change. We have evidence for essentially the change that we found in the red. The changes that we have in the purple are, are two changes and we don't have evidence that the evolution took place that way, that it took place twice like that. Our best guess should be that evolution took place in the way that we've outlined with the red. And so science is about, and phylogenetic systematics is about, using the evidence in the best possible way. And our evidence is we have an in-group. We don't know what the relationships are within that in-group, but we're working on that. We know that our first out-group, thing we've called our sister group, we know that that's the sister group of our in-group and that it's phylogenetically related to that very closely. And we know we have another out-group here, a second out-group. Once we know that, we can see that we have to have one evolutionary change there. That's what we have evidence for. We don't have evidence for more than that. Well, this brings us to our second principle of cladistics, and really important principle, second time, and that's the principle of parsimony. The word parsimony means carefulness or care in the use of money or material resources. In our case, we call it the law of parsimony, and that's the principle that we shouldn't hypothesize more forces or causes, or in this case, evolutionary steps. We shouldn't hypothesize more evolutionary steps than are necessary to account minimally for the facts we see. So no more, no more evolutionary steps should be hypothesized than we need to minimally account for the distribution of characteristics we see. And the reason for this is because if you say that we're going to accept one more evolutionary step than we have evidence for, why not two more? Why not three more? Why not four more? Why not just make it whatever you think that the phylogenetic tree should be? Just make up your trees then if you're going to not use evidence for them. So we want to use our evidence very carefully. Well, let's look at a more realistic case now. 
we've looked at this really weird case where the in-group is uniform. Let's look at a case where the in-group is variable. We find both dry and fleshy fruits in that in-group. And now we're still going to look at the case where our out-groups are both uniform and both dry. So what we want to do now is we want to find out what the ancestor is. And we want to find out what state occurs there because it'll tell us what the drive state is in the in-group. So let's just for a minute assume So if we knew that the ancestor had dry fruits, we could put all of our fleshy fruited taxa together in the in-group and they would make a monophyletic group. Okay, so that's where we want to get. How are we going to get there? Knowing what is in that, what that state is. Well, we're going to ask the question, could that ancestor be dry? Or could it be fleshy? So we're going to have two hypotheses. Hypothesis 1 and hypothesis 2. And we're going to look at what these hypotheses imply about the number of evolutionary changes. And we're going to choose the hypothesis which implies the smallest number of evolutionary changes because of the principle of parsimony. All right. You might want to stop the lecture at this point and um, try to figure this out on yourself. Okay, so here's our first hypothesis. Fruit texture is dry. So if the texture is dry in the ancestor, then we would know that all of the fleshy fruits form a monophyletic group. And it must be, since we have in the in-group both dry and fleshy fruits, it must be the case that the change from dry to fleshy occurred here one time. So in other words, dry fruits occurred every place else on the tree. So if we were to trace those dry fruits like this all the way up the tree, they would come up to all of these taxa up here, and only the taxa I have in red then would form the monophyletic group with one change from dry to fleshy. Let's take a look at the second hypothesis. Here's our second hypothesis. We're going to assume that the ancestor of our group here was fleshy. Our in-group was fleshy. So in this case, all of our dry taxa would be placed in a phylog phylogenetic group. And we would have a change from fleshy to dry that would be one change. But now let's look at our outgroups. Here we have dry fruits. So the dry fruits must have somehow become fleshy if the ancestor of our in-group was fleshy. So there must have been some other evolutionary change here, someplace on the tree, and pretty clearly it had to be here, from dry to fleshy. So there had to be a change from dry to fleshy fruits in this lineage so that there could be another change from fleshy to dry up in the in-group. This character distribution then makes our ancestor fleshy, which is what our hypothesis was.
So this distribution of characters and this assumption means that we have to have two evolutionary steps. So we have one phylogeny that requires, or one hypothesis that requires one evolutionary step and one hypothesis that requires two evolutionary steps. And we're going to choose between them based on the principle of parsimony. We're going to choose between them based on which is, which is the simplest explanation. Well, it should be pretty clear that the simplest explanation is the one that requires only a single phylogenetic change. So we choose the hypothesis, which is the simpler one. It's this hypothesis. Our ancestor was dry, and we are able to say we are going to put all of the fruits, all of the taxa with fleshy fruits, into a monophyletic group. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to know something about the phylogeny of our in-group, and by using out-group comparison, we've got a good handle on it. Well, here's another example. This diagram shows basically the same thing that we've just done. And I'd like you to pause the presentation now and try to work through this on your own. It's pretty much explained in the figure caption. But before we go on, please work through this yourself and do the best you can. And then come back here to the presentation and I'll work through it with you. Pause it now. Okay, we're back. We're seeing in the first two diagrams essentially what we've already done. We're seeing the case where we're looking at our in-group. Our in-group is now shown with a little bit of detail on the inside. But we're looking at the in-group and we want to know what the drive states are in the in-group. In this case now they've used one as the primitive state in our first diagram A. And we can see with our out-group a single outgroup in this case, having the character state A, and assuming that our ancestor has the character state A, we get one change from 1 to 0 inside of our in-group, and so we can say that is a monophyletic group. So the other group over here is also drawn as a monophyletic group, but that we know now that that's not true. The ones with the, the taxa with character state 0 based on this character distribution, form a monophyletic group. Now, what would happen if we assumed our ancestor was zero? This is number B, or diagram B. In that case, we would have to explain the evolution of character state 1 in Y, so we would need one change here, and we would have to explain the evolution of character state 1 in our in-group and so we would one, need one change here. So this is the less parsimonious explanation. So this is the explanation A. This is the hypothesis we would accept. And we're going to reject this hypothesis. Let's go on and look at diagram C. C shows what happens if we add an extra outgroup also with character state 1. We still have Y as our direct sister group with character state 1, and we have our variable in group with characteristics 1 and 0. Our best hypothesis is still going to be that the ancestor has character state 1, M is an ancestor here, and that we have one change from character state 1 to character state 0, our derived state, which explains the distribution of these characters. So in this tree C, like in tree A, 0 is advanced, and one is primitive. Now I said earlier I was always going to use zero as the primitive character state, but this is a illustration from a textbook, so they've done it a slightly bit differently, which is not bad for you to see. On to D and E. D and E show the 
situation where we have, again, two outgroups, one of which Z, Z has zero. Our close sister group, Y, has one still. And now we're going to look at the two situations where we have one as the hypothesized ancestor in M and zero as the hypothesized ancestor in M. So we're going to compare these two cases. Well, if we get the hypothesized ancestor of our in-group being M with 1, and we have this out-group of 0, there must have been some change down here where we establish 0 as the most primitive state for the whole tax, this whole group of taxa. That changed to 1 here, and then the 1 changed to 0 within our in-group. In E, we have the same thing, where we must have had the ancestor being 0 to give us our 0 in Z. That was retained in the ancestor M. But then we've had two evolutionary steps, one here to produce the 1 in Y, and the second one here to produce the 1 in our in-group, X. So in both of these cases, we have two evolutionary steps well, three evolutionary steps if we count the ancestor one, but let's not count that. Let's just count our steps within our little group of x, y here, and we'll say there are two evolutionary steps. So in this case, we can't tell what is primitive. It could be one, two evolutionary steps, or it could be zero two evolutionary steps. So there are cases like this where we can't tell and it's very important to recognize that. So in the cases that we can tell then we have a nice uh, good evidence for there being a monophyletic group based on the shared derived character states. Well what do we do about conflicting character distributions? What do we do when we find some characters like character 1 and character 3 that support putting two taxa together, E and F, as a monophyletic group. While other characters, like character number 2, support putting two other taxa together, like F and G in this case. Well, I hope it's pretty obvious that we should choose the grouping of taxa, we should choose the monophyletic groups that are supported by the greatest number of characters. So in this case, we would put E and F together in a monophyletic group because it's supported by the greatest number of characters. So more characters support that grouping, and so we place E and F together. We draw our phylogenetic tree as I've done with the red line. This is the more parsimonious use of the data. This is the more parsimonious explanation. Let's work through an example here and show you how this works out with real kinds of characteristics, or they're still kind of made up examples, but it's the basic, you'll get the basic idea. So we've got our five taxa here, Alba, Ludia, Nigra, Purpurea, and Rubens. So here's our taxa, and we have an outgroup. And we want to know the phylogeny based on this data that we've collected. We've coded the characteristics, so we can look at these either as labels with number uh, labels of the names of the characters or we can look at them as numbers same kind of thing we're going to look at them as the names so if we start inspecting our data matrix we might notice that there are certain characteristics that group taxa together and that are different from the outgroup so if we take the outgroup we're just going to assume that that's the primitive state for right now So we can see with character 1, elliptic is primitive, so that must mean that linear leaves are the drive state. And that puts Rubens, Purpurea, and Nigra together in a monophyletic group. Let's let her look at another character. If we look at character 3, we see that five stamen are primitive, and again that puts our three taxa 
nigra, purpurea, and rumens together in a monophyletic group. Inspecting the rest of the data matrix, we see that there are no other characters that suggest three things should go together like this. So we can start to draw our tree by placing these three taxa, nigra, purpurea, and rubens, together in a monophyletic group. And we draw down here our two characteristics, number one, a change from elliptic to linear leaves, and number three, a change from five petals to four petals, both supporting this monophyletic group. What else can we find? Well, we should be able to find some other characteristics that divide nigra purpurea and rubens up into smaller groups. If we look at characteristic number two, we see that there is only one taxa which has a slightly different characteristic than the outgroup, one derived one, and that is the taxa lutea. And so this has been plotted here on our phylogenetic tree as a uniquely derived characteristic in lutea. So that doesn't tell us anything about the grouping. What about characteristic number four? Flower color. Well, yellow is primitive, and red is the advanced characteristic, so that puts alba and lutea together, alba and lutea. So we have at least one characteristic that suggests ralba and lutea are together. How about characteristic number five? Well, five stamens are primitive at the very base, and so four and two stamens are advanced. So we can see here that four stamens would link together Rubens, Lutea, and Alba. Rubens, Lutea, and Alba. Hmm, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? And two stamens would link together Nigra and Purpurea. So we've got a character that links together nigra and purpurea and is a bit of a problem in the, uh, these other taxa. But we remember we already have one character that links nigra, purpurea, and rubens together. So this second one, character number five, is supporting that by linking nigra and purpurea together. We don't have anything else that links rubens with alba and lutea. So even though we have a character here that's putting Alba, Lutea, and Rubens together, we're not going to use it to create our phylogenetic tree because it's one of those oddball characters that doesn't seem to support what other characters are, do, are saying. So Nigra and Purpurea are going to end up together. We'll come back to character number six in just one minute. So let's finish that phylogenetic tree then. So this is the same diagram again. We've just lost my ink annotations. And what we have down here, then, is our groups. Nigra and purpurea, Rubens, Nigra, and purpurea, and Lutea, and Alba. And if we look at our characteristics, we see our first two that we did, one and three, linear leaves and four petals, uniting Rubens, Nigra, and purpurea. And then characteristic number five, the change from four stamens to two stamens, uniting nigra and purpurea, and character number four, the change from yellow stamens to red flowers, uniting lutea and alba. Now what about character number six? Character number six is another one of these very problematic characters. We notice that the smooth character state is primitive, spiny is derived, so this links purpurea and alba, purpurea and alba. But again, there are no other characters that unite those two, and so we draw our two characteristics here, number six, smooth changes to spiny in this lineage leading to alba, and smooth changes to spiny in the lineage leading to purpurea. So they've evolved in parallel. This is a characteristic that does not support the monophyletic groups that we've seen. And here we've highlighted those weird character stage, spiny pollen, which has evolved twice. This is an example of parallelism. An example of parallelism. So we have the parallel evolution of spiny pollen in two taxa.
And we know that only because we have other characteristics which support a phylogenetic tree that does not put Alba and purpurea together. And throughout this, we've been using the principle of parsimony so that we know how to group our taxa. Well, this brings up the topic of homoplasy. So we're seeing in this case, just what we've just seen with character number six, where we have some character distribution, character one in this case, where the character distribution of apparently shared derived characters does not support the phylogeny. And again, we're assuming here that zero is primitive. And we know that A, B, and C are in this phylogenetic relationship because we're back to our old God-given phylogeny here of A and B being sister groups and then that group of A, B being the sister group to C, these nested phylogenetic relationships. So our character does not agree with that. That is a case of what we call homoplasy. And we call it homoplasy because it's another one of Hennig's terms. And there are two types of homoplasy. We've seen one so far, this thing we've called parallelism, it's sometimes called convergence. You will see some textbooks that try to distinguish these two, but we are not going to do that in this course. We're just going to say parallelism and convergence are two synonyms for the same process, the process we've already seen, which is the independent evolution of two similar features in two or more lineages. And by similar features, we, need, we mean apparent synapomorphies. So a parent shared derived characteristics. Reversal is the other type of homoplasy, and this is loss of a derived feature, and that means the reestablishment or the re-evolution, the secondary evolution, of an ancestral feature. And we'll look at examples of both of these in a minute. So because there are these two types of cases where the similarity between two taxa is not due to common ancestry, instead of having to say parallelism or reversal every time you wanted to refer to them, Hennig coined another term, a new term, and he called this homoplasy. So homoplasy is the similarity not due to common ancestry, which takes place either by parallelism or by reversal. So this is an example, character six is an example of parallelism. The independent origin of a characteristic in two lineages, which we know, because of other data, are not phylogenetically related to each other. It's exactly what we did when we worked through this example. Here's an example from the Cactaceae and the Euphorbiaceae. We see spines in both of them. But these spines have evolved independently by parallelism. And we see that if we look at the placement of the Euphorbiaceae and the Cactaceae. In our, these are their two orders. So here's Cactaceae is going to be over here. And Euphorbiaceae is going to be over here. And you can see they're so far apart in these phylogenetic trees that you couldn't have the common origin of these two characteristics spines. And they actually look quite different, and they develop quite differently, too. So this is an example of parallelism. Reversal, an example of reversal, might have been the loss of the perianth in this group, Lemna and Wolfia, which are members of the aeroid family, the Araceae. And we can see here the flower, this is the female flower, and it's only carpels. There's no perianth at all, so we've lost the perianth completely. And again, if we look at the phylogenetic tree for this, here is the placement of the Araceae, 
that's its order, but ARAC would be in there. So no perianth there, and pretty much everything else around it, all of these guys here, they all have a perianth, or the vast majority have a perianth. So there's been a loss of it here. Reversion to an ancestral character state because the sister group to the angiosperms, things like Needham and Welwitchia, don't have perianths. So this is a reversion to that state. So I want you to work through this matrix on your own. Create a phylogenetic tree based on the characteristics you find here of W, X, Y, and Z. Pause the program to do that. And if you will do that, you will see on the next slide the answer. It's a pretty easy problem. We'll do some more complex problems as we go along in the course. But for right now, please pause this and do this one. And here's the answer. I'm not going to walk through this. Let's go on. The treatment of fossils. What do the clades do with fossils? Here we're back to our true phylogeny. We know that these are the true phylogenic relationships between A, B, and C. Where does a fossil go? Are we going to treat it like we would if we were an evolutionary systematist and put it as an ancestor in one of these groups or do something else? Well, let's look at a data matrix that supports this phylogenetic tree. We're again going to assume that zero is the primitive state. And if you look at these characteristics in this phylogenetic data matrix, you will see that the tree that's supported is the true tree here. A and B are sister groups, and then the group AB is the sister group to C. Let's add some data to this data matrix for our fossil. So we've added a new line at the base, and we've got the fossil. And we notice that the fossil has a uniquely derived character state. It's got character state 1 in character 2. What does that tell us as a cladist? Pause the show for a minute and think about that. Come back when you have an answer. I want you to take a minute and write down the answer. What does that tell us about where we should place the fossil? Well, I hope you thought that that should tell us that we're going to place the fossil next to the taxa AB. AB share the character state 1 in character 2, and so does the fossil, and so the fossil should go here. It goes in a monophyletic group with A and B. So we're treating fossils very similar to the way that a phoneticist would treat a fossil. We're treating them like any other taxon. We're not placing them in ancestor-descendant relationships. There's no kind of evidence that we would have in cladistics to place something in an ancestor-descendant relationship. Again, because all of our methods show that we have to place them in monophyletic groups. We use the data in a way to place tax in monophyletic groups. We don't have a way to use data to place them in ancestor-descendant relationships, and so we don't do that. Now, just like in phonetics, we get some important information out of this. We know that our taxa A, B are at least as old as that fossil. That is, the group A, B are at least as old as that fossil. So we have a way of placing a date on our phylogeny. If we know the date of the fossil or the approximate age of the fossil, we can say the monophyletic groups that it occurs in are at least that old. So just like in phonetics, we get some important information from the fossils, but we do not get ancestor-descendant relationships from them. Circumscription of taxa, our last subject. Well, you've got a lot of experience with this already you know that you're going to draw your lines around your taxa based on the phylogenies. Here's an example from Simpson where we place nigra and purpurea into a monophyletic group and we could name that taxon and then the next higher, higher level in the hierarchy would be 
Rubens, Nigra, and Purpurea all together, etc. The phylogenies or the classifications are shown here. A problem occurs with the circumscription of taxa when you have phylogenies that look like this. The Claytus really wanted to be able to reconstruct phylogenetic history just out of the classifications. That is, if you were to look at a textbook that gave you the classification of a group of organisms and you looked at the definitions of the genera, the families, the subfamilies, all those other levels of the hierarchy, you should be able to reconstruct the phylogeny out of that. That's what their ideal. And there was a real problem with this that no one has really sufficiently solved. Or if they did solve it, no one accepted the solution. And that solution was called the Philo Code. And we won't discuss it here. You can look it up if you want to, and you'll learn a lot more about classification than you probably want to know. Let's look at a second problem of this, or the main problem that they had with this. So if we had to be able to reconstruct very complex phylogenies just from knowing the names of the taxa, knowing the names of the higher level taxa, and we had a phylogeny like this, which looks like a ladder, we would have to name our first group up here, let's say we call it a genus, and then at every other level of this phylogeny we would have to place a genus there because every one of these other branches we have to know that that is equivalent to this branch here that it occurs at the generic level. But we also have to know that occurs with genus number one in a phylogenetic group. Let's call that a family. And we have to know that genus number three occurs as the sister group to that family. Call that an order. And now we have to keep continue going up here. And by the time you have finished this diagram, you're up at the kingdom level up here. So we have to start adding multiple, multiple subclasses, subdivisions, suborders, sub-suborders. It gets completely unwieldy. So this idea that you're going to be able to reconstruct your phylogeny just from the classification, the dream of the Claytus, was never met. Well, I said we were at our last subject, but really this is the last subject. I want to kind of end with paraphyletic and polyphyletic groups because you've seen these terms a lot of times, even in Simpson. There are two different definitions of them, and I want to end by telling you that these definitions don't make any sense and that we can forget the difference between paraphyletic and polyphyletic groups. We're just going to call something monophyletic or non-monophyletic, as we've been doing out throughout the whole semester. So here's the definitions. A paraphyletic group is a group of organisms consisting it's got to have a common ancestor, but not all the descendants of that common ancestor. Whereas a polyphyletic group is an idea of consisting of two or more common ancestors. So there's going to be, in this group, two or more common ancestors, and there's no single common ancestor, no single common ancestor that's part of the group. Let's look at how this plays out with some real examples, because it doesn't make any sense, I'm sure, yet. So here's the dicots. Here's our phylogeny of all of the angiosperms. I've circled here the dicotyledons. I've taken out this group, the monocotyledons. And we can see from our definitions that the dicots are paraphyletic. It's a, it's a group. That's the circled in red. It consists of a common ancestor. There's the common ancestor. But not all the descendants, not all the descendants of that common ancestor The monocotyledons are not included. Clearly paraphyletic. Let's change the way we drew our lines. We still have the dicots circled here, but now the dicots are polyphyletic. So polyphyletic, a group consisting of two or more common ancestors. So there's a lot of common ancestors here. Part of the group here has got a common, there's a common ancestor, there's a common ancestor of another part of the group. And these guys don't have all common ancestors, they're all kind of individual, so we could say they've got all individual common ancestors. So that's definitely two or more common ancestors. So there's no single common ancestor that's part of the group. The diclots are clearly polyphyletic. This isn't an isolated example. We can look at another example. 
I'm not going to try to pronounce all of these names. I'm just going to show you two circumscriptions here. And we can see this circumscription is clearly paraphyletic. It's got a common ancestor. The group contains some, but not all, of the descendants of that common ancestor. This group is clearly paraphyletic. And we change the drawing of our taxa. So this is one group. The red is one group. It's got two or more common ancestors. There's one here. There's another common ancestor down here. So there is no single one common ancestor of everything that we can go back to. And so this is clearly a polyphyletic group. So we can see there's really no difference between these terms paraphyletic and polyphyletic, and we're not going to use them. And the final, final point is that We've seen one type of way of drawing phylogenetic trees in up till now, but all of these other ways are equivalent ways of drawing the same tree. The only way you cannot draw a tree that's not allowed is you can't draw it to look like a dendrogram. So phylogenetic trees cannot look like dendrograms. Every other way is okay. Well, that finishes our study of phylogenetic systematics.